Hey everybody, this is Nathan here. Good morning from Los Angeles, California. I'm in sunny LA, sunny LA and you can actually uh, see behind me there's the uh, Jimmy Kimmel Live poster. Uh, I'm not in their studios, my brother works for them, So, uh, uh, but uh, I, I'm in Los Angeles again. And I'm on Skype here with uh, a very good friend, Joel Canfield, who has a book out uh, called You Don't Need a Job. And so uh, this was very intriguing to me because um, I... Uh, I don't know that I want a job or that even really I have a job. Uh, and, and Joel has been kind of, uh, you know, uh, connected to me since, since the beginning, since even before I left Los Angeles and started on this crazy routine. So very excited to have Joel here uh, sharing uh, a little bit about his new book uh, and uh, answering some questions. So Joel, hello there. How are you? Hello there. I'm excellent here in northern Wisconsin. And one little correction. Um, the title of the book is "You Don't Want a Job." Okay, so all right. it's not about it's not about need. Um, I it really is about what I believe people want, and they don't even realize it. Mm. Okay, no, thank you. That's a very important distinction. Uh, so you you don't want a job. So so let's uh, let's ask that, or let's let's get into that. How do you define a job? You know, why why do we not want one? What is it that we don't want? The traditional job is when you go work for someone else. They make the decisions. They make the bulk of the money. Uh, um, in Dan Pink's Drive, he makes some marvelous distinctions. He talks about autonomy over the four T's. Uh, time, task, technique, and team. Um, someone else chooses what you do, when you do it, how you do it, and what you do it with. That's a job. Um, and really, a job is the, the core of what makes it a job instead of a business for yourself is that someone else is making the call. Someone else is taking the risks. Someone else is making the rewards. And someone else decides what gets done, with whom, when. If you make all the calls, you could even be an employee on someone else's payroll and this is a, would be incredibly rare, but I wouldn't consider that a job. I'd consider that being an entrepreneur inside someone else's business. If they let you choose what you do, when you do it, who you do it with, and how you get the job done, that's not a job. I don't think that job exists. And if anyone has that job, uh, this is not rhetoric or hyperbole. I really want to hear about that. If you work for someone else, you're on their payroll, and they cut you a check for hours worked, but you get autonomy over those things, I would so love to hear about that. Because I don't believe that job exists. Hmm. And that's how I define a job, is that complete surrender of the responsibility and the rewards and the risks, that surrender of my financial care for myself goes to someone else. And I let them worry about it. That's a job. So now... Um... So now, why why don't we want that? Why don't we want that? Why don't we want somebody just you know telling us what to do? And and you know, it sounds like it would make our lives easier. Like, okay, I don't have to think about all these other you know variables that come up. Uh, why do we not want that? Well, uh, you may have heard that there are some problems with the economy. Um, I nobody needs to belabor that point. Sure. But uh, I use this example at the beginning of the book. Imagine you're walking along a mountain path with your hired guide, and as you're looking at the scenery, you slip. You slip and you go right over the edge, but your guide grabs you. He catches your hand, and so here's this big strong man holding you by one hand as you hang over this precipice, and you don't want to look down because if you look at the economy today. It's a long way down. Mm -hmm. So there you are. He's got a hold of you. Things are fine until he starts to slip. So now look up. Picture this in your head. Look up. Look into his eyes and imagine this. This is not some loved one, some lifelong friend. This is someone whose only relationship with you is money. And when he starts to slip, do you want to be hanging from his hand or hanging onto something with your own? Um, I know that it's easier to have a job right up in the till the day you don't. And all of a sudden, you're over the cliff and somebody else is going to let go. Because most employers 
I would say almost no employer is going to go over the cliff with you just to keep you from falling alone. What I'd love to talk about or hear a little bit about is how has you know not having a job uh, improved your life? What has it allowed you to do um, over the last? Because you know you also said it took you what about twenty five years to learn the lesson of not wanting a job, and so yeah, you know over that period, you know, as you've been learning this, what what has this mindset allowed you to do? This this shift. Over the years that I've been self-employed a number of times, and now it's been six years that we've been exclusively self-employed, I have gone from being a fairly timid person. As a kid, I was remarkably timid, and it has changed me. I exude confidence now, not just because I'm good at faking it, but I feel it. Mm. So there's that change in my personality. But also, I know that tomorrow I can take care of myself because... I'm hanging on with my own hands, and I have learned to stop measuring my wealth in dollars. Um, do I have all the money I could possibly want? No. Uh, I don't think anybody does. I think no, anyone who has a lot of money probably wants more. There are things they want. If I measure my time as uh, the author of um, Vagabonding, Rolf Potts, says, measure your time, your wealth in how much time you spend doing what you want to do instead of what you have to do. Mm. And that way, I'm the richest person I know. I spend all day every day doing things that I love doing. I get paid for quite a bit of it, and we make a living. We pay our bills. We eat regularly and live indoors. But if I want to take some time off to do volunteer work in the middle of the week, um, if the family and I need to go away for a three-day weekend like we just did, Nothing bad happens. I keep my schedule loose enough that there's no deadlines I'm going to miss. I don't even call them deadlines unless someone will actually die. Uh, they're goals. And I keep those dates loose enough that if I want to take some time off, if I wake up, occasionally I get headaches um, related to different health issues. I might wake up and have a brain that works about as well as cold oatmeal. I can take the day off. I can go outside for a walk. I can do whatever I want that day. And nothing bad happens. In the old days, I had a certain number of sick days, and then I just stopped getting paid for not showing up to work. Take too many sick days, and you don't have a job anymore, even if you really are sick. Self-employed, doing it right, you can maintain control of your schedule, and that's the biggest thing it's done for me. We work when we want, with whom we want, doing stuff we love. Uh, and then there was that little nomadic experiment for a year and a half where mm-hmm. my wife and our little girl and I traveled all over the U.S. and Canada, house-sitting for people in some pretty posh places, doing the same work we do right now all over the place. We've met people all over two countries because we could work from anywhere there's Internet access. Um, you might find an employer that would let you telecommute after a very long time. But create your own business that you can do over the internet or that you can do from wherever you are. And suddenly travel becomes a really inexpensive way of life compared to paying rent and utilities in Northern California. Mm. So the the total freedom over my schedule, and I do mean almost total freedom because of how we've designed our business and our life. Freedom over doing what I want. I do work I love. I write all day long. I just wrote another 3,000 words on a mystery I'm writing. Um, and stop for breakfast or lunch whenever I want. Um, And so the control over my schedule, control over what I do, control over who I work with. If I don't get a good vibe from someone who wants to hire me, I don't have to work with them because my boss, who's sitting over there in the rocking chair, says I only have to work with people I like. And since I like her and she likes me, we work together, but I don't have to work with people that make me anxious, frustrated, and angry which then carries over to the people, the clients that I do love. So there's, there's a tiny slice of what I get out of working for me. I'm, I'm totally on board with you there. I mean, just this morning, uh, well, for, for quite a while, you know, I have this morning routine that can take anywhere from two to three hours, and that's all you know, like personal things. It's you know, doing some creative work, doing some exercise, meditation. Now, this morning I was in L.A. I went up to Runyon Canyon and hiked up and then meditated at the top and came back and made a smoothie and, you know, took a shower. And, you know, by by the time, you know, I was hiking up Runyon, most people would be at their desk uh, starting to answer emails. And, and 
I am so grateful for that uh, for that uh, control or or say in my schedule. And I think it's it's so huge, and when you can appreciate that, it is possible um, to have that. Which which leads me into my final question. Um, you know, who is this book for? Because you know, uh, just as entrepreneurship is not for everyone, um, who would you say it might be ready for uh, this little spark? Well, not everyone is cut out to be an entrepreneur. I understand that some people don't have the drive to go find clients, to create a business, to do things like that. But everyone who has a job has some kind of skill they're getting paid for right now. Maybe you don't want to be an entrepreneur, but you can still be a freelancer. Instead of selling that skill to one person, mm -hmm. selling all your hours to one person, what if you were selling your time to five, six, a dozen different people, lose one job, and you've still got 80 to 90 percent of your income, and that doesn't have to be permanent. You go get another client, and you can freelance, and freelancers generally make less of an hourly rate or less per project than an entrepreneur might. Uh, freelancing as a web developer, for instance, subcontracting for someone else, you'll make less money per hour, but you have a lot of the you don't have a lot of the entrepreneurial effort, some of the risk, the jobs, the you know the drive that an entrepreneur has to have. A freelancer can get by with a lot less of that. Mm. Um, and and some people, you know, if you work in a GM factory operating that particular kind of machine, you might not have a readily transferable skill. The people that this book are for is for right now are people who are doing something that they know someone somewhere is doing running it doing as a business on their own and making good money at and they realize they're just giving their life to their employer in change for do in exchange for some dollars mm. that's the person who's going to be get something right now and realize that they don't have to do that anymore but i believe uh charles handy has been saying this for over 30 years the guy who wrote the empty raincoat and a bunch of other great books he walked away from uh, an executive position at british Petro petroleum 30 years ago to, as he said, go portfolio. He said the age of the job is over. One person paying all your money, that doesn't make any sense anymore. You need multiple streams of income. And so anybody that's working at a job, one job, really needs to wake up and pay attention to the fact that jobs aren't going to be around much longer. They're an artifact of the change to the industrial age. And as we move to the internet age, we're 15 years into the era of the internet. As we move this direction, jobs are going to go away whether people like it or not. Mm. And so, sure, some people aren't ready for the message in this book right now, but I don't want them to take 25 years of suffering with miserable, miserable jobs like I had before they realize that they can go do something else and take control and you can do that before it's done to you, because one way or another, very few people who have a job right now are going to live out their days at that job. Yeah, I uh, I completely agree, and I think um, I, I think you're right on the money, and, and I think that's a great point to kind of end. Uh, uh, there's a lot more we could get into, and a lot more we could talk about, but of course, this is uh, just an ongoing conversation, so. Um, yeah, it's it's definitely a changing landscape, and and as Seth Godin talks about so much, you know, either you uh, you know you adapt or you die, you know, you innovate or you die, and uh, uh, he he may not be that drastic with it, but that's kind of the sense, you know, like we've seen companies, yeah. we've seen entire companies go under because they haven't figured out how to um, how to adapt, how to become twenty first century and uh, and go forward. So. Um, this is just the next uh, the next iteration of uh, of us as worker bees. You know what are we what are we going to do? So, Joel, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciated talking with you, and and thank you for sharing uh, absolutely this this message with uh, with everybody on nonstop awesomeness. I think um, I think there's a lot uh, a lot to be said of you know if you don't want a job and and you want to you know maybe travel more or get out or have a little more freedom in your life. It's it's all. Uh, this may be the path for you. So again, thank you so much, and uh, uh, hope Absolutely. all is hope all is going well in Wisconsin. We'll talk again soon. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Nathan. All right. Bye bye. Thanks everybody for watching. Take care.